All right, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So I will be performing all sorts of tasks today, I guess, because I'll be introducing myself, and then we'll just keep going. So I'll just turn down the mic a little bit so I don't blow out anybody's eardrums, but that should be all right. All right, so in honor of President's Day, I figured Let's talk about the presidents and their connections to Genesee County. Uh, and it's kind of amazing how many have passed through, uh, considering our, our little part of the world. Um, so I'm going to go through the ones that we can confirm have visited. And I will share a few that it's a little iffy on, or we just don't have a whole lot of documentation about it. So, before I jump into the ones that I have documentation, there's a few, a couple that I'll throw out there um, that I don't mention explicitly in the presentation. The first is Miller Fillmore. Uh, he was a, a New York boy, grew up in the Finger Lakes and eventually settled in Buffalo. So we know he probably passed through our area, but we don't have anything specific about it. Um, and he may have come here during his law career as well, but again, there's no specifics. And the other is Grover Cleveland, which we do know he came once, but it seems like not much was written about it, which is kind of odd because it was a court case. Uh, in 1882, uh, he came to Genesee County uh, as part of his job as Erie County Sheriff, so there must have been some kind of crossover jurisdiction going on there. Um, but again, might not have been too important of a case because they didn't really write too much about it, or at least I couldn't find anything about it. So those are the two that have local connections to Western New York explicitly, but how much in Genesee County is hard to say. So, so I did these in numerical order of when they were president, so it's not necessarily chronological, and it is also not only when they were president. Some came before they were president, some came after they were president. So uh, it's just a president when they visited. So we will jump right in. So our first one is John Quincy Adams, uh, who actually came to Batavia in 1843 after he was president. And he was on a personal trip as he came to visit his good friend Phineas Tracy, who he served in Congress with. Um, and they were both part of the anti-Masonic and the Whig party, so they were very close. Uh, Phineas was set up shop here in Batavia, one of the prominent families. So John Quincy decided to, you know, time to take a train ride into uh, Batavia and check it out and talk with his good friend Tracy. Uh, this was at the end of uh, John Quincy Adams' life. He was only passed away a few years later. Uh, so he is the, the sixth president. So for anybody who wants to get their order down, we'll keep the numbers going. Uh, but uh, again, not any official business, just a nice little personal trip from Massachusetts. All right, then we have Martin Van Buren, the eighth president, who actually came twice. And what I found is we do have a few that have come multiple times. So the first time while he was governor, uh, after the completion of the New York Central Railroad from Rochester to Buffalo, he came here to Batavia to kind of follow the construction and see its progress. Uh, and then the next time when he was president, he stopped in Batavia while on a sightseeing tour, eventually making his way to Niagara Falls. And while he stopped here in Batavia briefly, about 1,500 people showed up to see him. And from what I can tell, I don't know if it was truly a scheduled stop or if he stopped at the, the uh, depot here in Batavia and everybody heard about it and just kind of flopped. So, uh, and that's the other thing I've noticed is most of these are built around the train station here in Batavia. And there's a few that word got out and everybody came, even at the best wishes of the president for there not to be a crowd. So uh, people flocked no matter what. Uh, so he actually, uh, Van Buren stopped to see the state arsenal, which was where Topps is today. And then attended a ball at the Eagle Hotel, which became the Hotel Rich. So uh, he actually did spend some time here in Batavia. Ryan? Yes. Do you know when he was governor? So that would have been uh, right before he was president. So we're talking early 1830s at that point. Uh, 
Uh, that was his jumping off point. So, uh, John Tyler uh, came while he was president. Same year as John Quincy Adams, 1843. On June 17th, uh, he was on his way to Buffalo. Uh, and he stopped in Batavia, and he actually held a conference with the Holland Land Company officials that were here in Batavia still. This was right at the end of the land company's existence here in Batavia. Uh, and they had a meeting at the American Hotel to discuss property records, uh, as there started to be some controversy revolving around Dutch ownership. Uh, and not just here, but also in eastern New York, as there was some riling up around uh, some of the old Dutch families of where the proper ownership should be for lands along the Hudson Valley. So he stopped here and said, this isn't happening over here, is it? Um, so he just made a little pit stop to inform the land company officials that he was keeping an eye on what was going on. To my knowledge, nothing ever really came out of it. It was resolved rather quickly, and within a couple of years, the land company had basically dissolved here in Batavia anyway. So they didn't have, hold too many of the property records at that point. So now we're moving into some heavy hitters. Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so I can't talk about Abraham Lincoln without at least mentioning Abraham Lincoln's 15 Lost Hours, which was a uh, book written quite some time ago now about his stay with a family in Alexander. And it's probably become the most talked about presidential visit. Uh, and this supposedly happened, and I'm using the word supposedly, so that'll give me a hint what's coming here, uh, on his victory tour after he was elected in 1861. Now, we do know that he made a quick stop in Batavia on that because he was passing from Buffalo to Rochester along the train. Uh, but again, it was just a quick stop. Uh, that was on February 17, 1861, uh, at 6.35 a.m. And... Uh, he actually spoke to the crowd that gathered. He said, we are in God's hands today. Let us do without faltering the task he has set for us to do. But supposedly he stayed in Alexander that night before heading off to Rochester. Uh, however, we can't confirm any part of that. Um, and that book was written by uh, a woman who, it was her family history being passed down, but it was written down about 80 years after the fact. So we take that with a grain of salt, but I figured I'd have to mention it because that's what everybody seems, tends to remember. Uh, but we don't have any documentation that that ever happened, and it's probably unlikely that he did that, considering the tight schedule he had to keep, um, considering he had to be into Washington, D.C. within a couple weeks of that. So any delay would have hindered that. Brian, the, the last owner of that house, confirms that he was not there. See, there we go. We have confirmation. So, um, but it's still a, a, it's a fun story, but that's really all it is. But, yes. <laughs> but Abraham Lincoln did, well, at least his body came through a second time. Uh, so Lincoln's funeral train did stop in Batavia on April 27th, 1865. Uh, it was actually pulled by the Locomotive, the Dean Richmond, the personal locomotive of Mr. Dean Richmond, who was a good friend of Mr. Lincoln. Uh, and the Dean Richmond train actually pulled Lincoln's funeral train from Rochester to Buffalo. And of course, Richmond, being a resident here in Batavia, he made sure it stopped in Batavia. I don't know if that was an original scheduled stop, but it stayed here for about 15 minutes. And a few thousand people showed up, even at 5.08 in the morning. So uh, the depot was decked out in all sorts of morning guard uh, and patriotic fervor. Uh, and all the ladies came up to drop off flowers. And you could actually see the casket. Uh, they had it sort of open. Uh, plus, there were other dignitaries riding on the train, but uh, no other president uh, at that time. And we do have some pictures of the train, the depot, and some other Lincoln artifacts in the military room if you want to check that out. All right, James Garfield. I have a very soft spot for James Garfield. He was the first president I ever had to research. 
didn't take that long, but um, short presidency. Short presidency. Uh, but uh, uh, Garfield was running for president in the 1880 election. He was the Republican candidate. And on August 4th, 1880, he made a stop in Batavia at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, and also on the train was another future president, Benjamin Harrison, who was helping out on the campaign trail, who was a senator, I believe, at that time. But they were both rather well-known Civil War generals, so reading the articles, it's always General Garfield and General Harrison, which I think a lot of people forget that they actually did serve high-ranking military officers. Now, if you know anything about Garfield, he was probably our second quietest president behind Calvin Coolidge. Um, didn't want to speak too much to the crowd. He let everybody else speak for him, but he did uh, give a short speech. And then he let Harrison, who was a little more boisterous, take over and rev up the crowd to vote Republican. Uh, there was quite a large crowd, um, and the police actually had to kind of push people away from the train. Um, plus, there was a whole lot of other politicians on this campaign trail that wanted to speak. So they ended up staying quite a while, but Garfield only spoke for a brief part of that. And he was said to have hung back in the train, basically, for most of it and not get up in front of the crowd. So uh, Mr. Garfield, and he's elected, and within a year, he's assassinated. So uh, that's about his major accomplishment as president. So, but uh, yes, he's got a soft spot in my heart. So. Moving on, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, another one of our presidents who actually came a couple different times. Uh, the first time was on November 1st, 1900, while he was still governor of New York, but it was on the campaign trail for William McKinley as he was his vice presidential candidate uh, and running mate. Uh, at time, that time, he had a large crowd, about 5,000 people meet him at the uh, corner of Jackson Ellicott, right at the depot there. Uh, he was very popular even at that point. Uh, he had quite the fame preceding him, which vaulted him into a vice presidential uh, nomination. Uh, and then, he's the first one I can tell to actually stop through Batavia, not by train, but by automobile. Uh, in 1914, he was on a, what we call a stumping tour, so basically a political speech tour, um, after his failed running for presidency in 1912. And uh, he spoke to a crowd and then had a quick lunch at the Hotel Richmond uh, with the dignitaries of the city. Uh, so he, he's the trendsetter again for us in terms of uh, now we're actually seeing the influx of transportation in another way than just at the depot. Uh, and, and we actually get two presidents in a row. We get William Howard Taft next to succeeded Roosevelt. Uh, and this is an actual picture from Batavia. Uh, he's one of the few that I could readily find a picture of it in our collection. So uh, that is from the back of his campaign train. Um, but he also made two quick stops. Uh, the first, this is 1908, uh, while he was on campaign. Uh, he stopped at the train station here, but also then went to uh, a little establishment called the Farmer Shed, which was on State Street, to uh, speak to uh, the local organizations here. Uh, and then in 1910, still while president, he happened to pass through Batavia, but to my knowledge, didn't really stop and speak to anybody. Um, but he was spotted, so uh, Mr. Taft is one of our best documented ones of, of stopping here. Calvin Coolidge, this is one of my favorite stories just because anything with Calvin Coolidge is not that interesting, but it always gives me a laugh because he's a man who did not embrace the presidency the way most do. Um, we all know him as Silent Cal. Um, he once got bet by a reporter that he could get him to say three words when he visited the White House, and Cal's response was, you lose. So uh, he was also a man who would spend most of his day in his pajamas, even take official cabinet business while in his pajamas. He wanted to be comfortable. So, uh, so in 1922, uh, he was then vice president, Calvin Coolidge, actually briefly stopped in Batavia. 
Uh, it was so brief that he never left his car, and he only shook a few hands at the bystanders that happened to see him along the street. Um, and nobody knew he was stopping. Uh, I think it was just a pit stop to either get gas or just, you know, take a minute from driving. And uh, everybody got so excited, they called the delegations of the Chamber of Commerce, but he was gone before they got there. <laughs> Cal did not want to uh, really talk to anybody on this trip, so uh, I just get a chuckle out of that one every time. So. All right, now, FDR. Um, He's the only one I can tell that made three stops here in uh, Batavia and Genesee County. Um, the first came in 1920 when he was still Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And this was just after the end of World War I and he was there to basically promote the importance of the sort of continued war effort following World War I uh, and to sort of prop up the Navy especially and the need to keep funding our armed forces as after World War I, there was a, as the United States did at that time, draw back inward uh, and become more isolationist. Um, he would later visit as governor of New York, and then in 1940, while on campaign, for while president. Uh, while he campaigned here in Batavia, he never left his train, though, no, uh, and did speak to a large crowd of the people. Uh, it's also important to note that in the 1944 election, uh, both Eleanor and his son, FDR Jr., both came to campaign for him. Um, so we do have some ancillary connections to other presidential visits, but uh, he did not come himself. Uh, and FDR, was, FDR Jr. came several times to pump up the crowd. We, I think at that point, Batavia kind of become your, your secondary stop, so we weren't sending the uh, big hitters, we were sending our, our lower level dignitaries uh, from the campaign. Uh, so he came to really uh, express the, the need for his father to be elected again. And Eleanor uh, came and also spoke to a lot of the ladies groups here in Batavia and also in Leroy. Uh, so she was much more involved, and that was more of a uh, a philanthropic uh, kind of trip as well, more so than a political one. And then we get Harry Truman, who uh, succeeded FDR. Uh, so again, he stopped twice, the first time while he was campaigning in 1948, that's the famous one where he's holding up the paper that Dewey beats Truman. Uh, and he wasn't planning on stopping in Batavia, uh, again, was on his way to Buffalo for a major campaign stop. But when they noticed that 5,000 people were lining the tracks, they said, we kind of have to now. Uh, so it really caught Truman off guard. He didn't have anything prepared to, to say to the crowd. Um, but he did his usual campaign uh, speech um, that I think he was planning on using in Buffalo, just kind of shortened it. So he only stayed for a short amount of time. But this one we actually have documentation from the Daily News that the crowd was so, we'll say, pushy that a few people actually got injured and the police had to be called in to keep everybody back. So everybody was just that excited to see Harry Truman. Um, <laughs> but he stopped again in 1952. Uh, this time he was no longer running as a presidential candidate, but he was one of the main uh, promoters of the Democratic ticket. Uh, so he stopped again in 1952, uh, and the crowd was a little smaller, only 2,000 people showed up this time, um, and he was trying to build up support for the Democratic ticket uh, for that election. And also that year, actually just a few weeks apart, President Eisenhower shows up to also do the same thing on his whistle stop tour, as it was referred to, uh, which is probably the reason why Truman stops in Batavia in 1952, because Eisenhower had already stopped. So you have to counteract the message. Um, so he visited, and they had nearly 6,500 people, which at that time was uh, about 40% of the population of Batavia came. Uh, and again, lined up all around the tracks. Uh, Eisenhower gave a few uh, speeches, uh, but nothing of much 
substance in the end, and he too never left the train. Uh, as happened with a lot of these campaign stops, it was a quick wave and hello, and within an hour we're out of here. So uh, Eisenhower was one of those kind of stops. <sighs> Gerald Ford. So now we're moving up to 1968, and funny enough, I actually got a call from Jerry Williams of Williams Law Firm here in Batavia, and he had to tell me all about that night that Gerald Ford came to Batavia because he was there. So I'll add in his details, which I didn't know, uh, and I can pass around, uh, got a few copies of the, the program from his speech. So uh, Gerald Ford was, at that point, the Speaker of the House, and uh, well, no, sorry, the minority leader of the House of Representatives. He wasn't speaker yet. Uh, and he came as the guest of honor for the Genesee County Republican dinner that was held at the Moose Club here in Batavia. Uh, and it was basically an overnight stop. But uh, Jerry Williams added some info for me. And uh, it's quite a funny story, actually. So Gerald Ford flew in from Washington to Rochester, and then got a ride into Batavia. Uh, and that night after the event, everybody was leaving. But Gerald Ford had no way of getting back to DC because there was no return flight. <laughs> because as Jerry put it, everybody just flew commercial. There wasn't a private plane for him to take. So we kind of sat around figuring out how are we gonna get him back to Washington? And uh, eventually, uh, uh, the Woodward's out in Leroy, kind of, or no, sorry, uh, Leroy Machinery, the uh, owner there stepped up and said, uh, we'll just fly out of Leroy on my private plane, and I'll get you back to Washington, D.C. So they go out to the uh, Leroy Airfield, and they've got the plane all started up, and the uh, owner uh, of the plane says, well, anybody want to go? to Washington, D.C., and Jerry told me, in his words, he didn't know if he was joking or not, but his wife who was with him jumped right on the plane, so he said, I guess we're going to D.C., uh, and they flew back to D.C. with Gerald Ford on the plane, and then got a ride back to Batavia on that same plane. So, so it seems like that story might have been more interesting than the actual event, but uh, it's a pretty funny one. And he did... Um, Gave me a couple copies if you want to pass these around of the program so of the event. Detail, then no, um, <laughs> really, unless you were a president, a sitting president, not even a campaigning president, you really didn't get a whole lot of security oh. detail. Nor did you have access to a, a government transportation. So, um, so that was something I literally learned yesterday. That whole story. Jerry called me up and said, I got something to tell you, so you can add that to, uh, to the story of Gerald Ford coming to uh, Batavia. Well, I wonder, Ryan, at that time, if he was minority leader of the House, if, if he was um, a member of the House of Representatives, being the minority leader, or I'm assuming he was uh, a, House, a member of the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. from, from New York State? or No, kind of, he yeah. was... What was he? Michigan. Yeah, I believe he was representing Michigan. Okay. Um, I see. Yeah, so he was he was the highest ranking Republican member of the House of Representatives. That's right before the election when it switches over to a Republican led House. Okay. Um, so that's eventually he becomes Speaker of the House, but he's not at that point yet. So um, yeah, so funny little story to add on to that. But yeah, he was uh, the Republican. Dinner got some major speakers to come here. So, was he our only elected president? So he is, well, he is the only one not to be elected on a presidential ticket. He never won a presidential election or was part of a ticket that won. Um, so he was not elected as vice president. We have some that were only elected as vice president and not president. Um, but in fact, a few on our list, John Tyler's one of those. He took over for William Henry Harrison, but didn't win his own election. Um, let's see. Anything else? 
Um, for instance, Roosevelt, he does win an election, but he takes over as vice president. Uh, and same thing with Truman, that they, so, um, but yeah, he's the only one not to be elected to vice president or president. It's a crooked path, so to speak. Yeah, he's, he's got our, you, you can say he had a very meteoric rise, as within, you know, a few weeks he goes from Speaker of the House to President, so, um, and that's the only time this happened. There's actually been a few other times since they've thought about it, but uh, not the only time that's happened, so. All right, and then our most recent uh, presidential visit uh, happened in 1981, um, and we have had famous political figures since, but uh, not president. Uh, so you had George H.W. Bush. Uh, at that time, he was vice president to Ronald Reagan, and he came to speak at GCC for a Boy Scout event uh, at the personal invite of Barbara Connell. So without Barbara Connell, he's not coming here. Um, that tells you how much sway Barbara Connell had. Um, as he was good friends with all of these individuals, and if he asked them to do something, they generally did. Uh, so there's a crowd of about 500 people. Uh, and we spoke about the importance of the Boy Scouts uh, and how they helped shape young lives. Um, and of course, it's not just about the Boy Scouts. He had to talk about the strength of the United States during the Reagan administration and had to bring in a little bit of a political campaign slant to that. Um, but it was just for a Boy Scout event. Um, we've also had Robert Kennedy come while on the presidential campaign trail, um, but he never is actually president, so I left him out of this list. Um, but uh, if anybody is really interested in our famous visitors, this is where I got most of my information from. It was written back when Sue Conklin was our county historian. And it's um, heroes, politicians, and uh, reformers visiting or of Genesee County. They wrote sort of a series of, they call it Famous Genesee. This was book two. Uh, so this is where I got most of the articles from, along with some other uh, anecdotes and things. So those are all the presidents that have taken the time to visit our, our great area uh, and grace us with their presence. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions or comments, stories, or whatever uh, along with that. During those <clears throat> presidential, presidential visits when they came to our train, was the train station of Batavia roughly in the vicinity of where Jackson Elementary school is now, or is it more off of Ellicott Street? So basically, the intersections of Jackson and Ellicott. Okay. The Salvation Army? Oh, pretty much right there. Oh, really? So, okay. um, <clears throat> yeah. But that general area is where everybody would congregate. Yeah, the depot was right, right along the tracks there, but that's where she was near that spot. So, Conveniently yeah. located. <laughs> to my knowledge, nobody visited Madam Edna's while they were on a presidential tour. Um, but, uh, yes. Well, she wasn't here when Lincoln was here, so, but, you know. There was a light going in the window. Yes. I'm sure she might have gotten busy after those uh, events, but if only Warren G. Harding had stopped, maybe he would have visited. So, there's a little presidential humor for you, so. Was Coolidge in his pajamas when he <laughs> To my knowledge, he was not. He was in formal driving wear, as you had at that time. So he got very comfortable in the White House in that sense. Uh, yeah. You had mentioned um, one of the presidents did met at the American Hotel for negotiations. Was that the one in the White House? Eagle Hotel. If I did, I meant to say yeah, Eagles. Say oh, no, uh, that was Tyler. Um, he did me at the American Hotel. That was here. There was an American Hotel here in Batavia. Uh, that was, if I'm thinking correctly, it was along Main Street. Um, it's one of those that kind of didn't last all that long. But that was the big hotel before the Eagle Hotel was built. Um, not on the same spot. That's just, it kind of took, took over the spot. So, yeah. No, all of this was within Genesee County that they met, so. So, 
facial hair. Okay, I know this as you went through all those presidents. They, they all either had a full beard or as the years went by, they went in the mustache. Calvin, who was the first one without? Yeah. So, so there's that you shows. Yeah. So there's sort of a we can kind of run through this because presidential facial hair is actually a very it's been very well documented because <laughs> we don't have anything better to focus on sometimes than just facial hair. Um, so uh, John Quincy Adams had his extended mutton chops. That was sort of a a, a style of the period. Uh, but when he was president, he was much more clean shaped. This is after he was president. Uh, this would have what he looked like when he came to the taping, basically. Um, Van Buren's famous for his mutton chops. Again, that was sort of the style. But you, as you can see, it doesn't go, no beards. It was, and no mustaches still. Everything is just down the side of the face. Looks a bit like me when I wake up. <laughs> Tyler, again, very clean shaven. Lincoln is the first president to wear to have a beard while in office. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Because it was not seen to be very presidential and proper to have a full beard. And it's a beard with no mustache. Yes. Now he did not wear a beard until he became president. And you might have heard the story of how that happened. It actually has a Western New York connection. Uh, he was on the campaign trail in 1860 and made a stop down in. And was passing through and got a letter from a little girl from Westfield, New York, which is down by Jamestown, and said, you would look really good if you had a beard. <laughs> Apparently that was convincing enough, and he decided to wear one, and he actually sets the trend, because up until, well, let's see, up until McKin, well, Grover Cleveland doesn't have a beard, but he has a, a big, a full mustache. Harrison has a full beard. Um, McKinley doesn't have any facial hair, so he kind of bucks that trend. But then you have Roosevelt with his mustache, Taft with his mustache and sort of goatee look. Um, and then the kind of the 20s come along, and that fashion goes out, and it's back to clean shaven, and basically that's what we've had ever since. So it's gone back to that presidential look of being clean, clean facial hair, uh, and so there's there's eras of presidential uh, facial hair you can sort of point out too that that actually reflects sort of the the cultural changes of the time. So um, and sometimes the presidents are the ones leading that charge. They say, well, the president's got that, so that's that's the style. Um, other times they're kind of going along with the trend is, you know, it makes you look either more easy to talk to or looks you make you look more formal, you know, whatever the, the case may be. So. I don't <laughs> Well, if I showed you every single one, you would start to see the pattern. But it's the cultural trend. I think it right. Yes. It, it's not it's, it, yeah. It, it's not they say, okay, now you can't have a beard. It's it was always preference, it's just what the style of the day was. So. Just like kind of hair. Exactly. Yeah. So. Whatever goes. Yes. yes. You mentioned uh, security for the presidents, and now we have Secret Service. Any idea when that security started? So, the Secret Service is actually signed into office the day that President Lincoln is assassinated. But that's not what the Secret Service was created for. It was created to stop counterfeiting. And that was its role for quite a while. It's actually after the assassination of McKinley that the Secret Service takes on a protection detail. Because um, at that point, we've had three presidents assassinated within 40 years. And they started to see more of the need for protection while the presidents were out and about. But uh, oftentimes before then it was either the president's private staff that was sort of hired on to watch out for things, but oftentimes they, there was no armed, armed security or anything like that um, while they were at social functions or out meeting people. Because it was also seen about 
The big thing with the presidency for a long time, and this included the White House, is accessibility. And a lot of presidents believe that I need to be open to the people. So you could actually walk into the White House and ask to see the president. Andrew Jackson. But even after that, Lincoln was a big one of a proponent of that. Uh, there was this much greater sense, and I don't think the formality of the position is what we think of it today either, is that the White House was just like another dwelling that, hey, I want to go talk to the leader of the country. You might not be able to, but you could walk right in and say, I'm here. And nobody would probably stop you. So, um, so yeah, the, while you, you don't see, you just see a lot of staff when presidents are visiting up until, you know, relatively modern days. Yes? Yeah, Jeffrey, you know, uh, talking about uh, Coolidge, Jefferson used to come down in his slippers to uh, sit with people and yep. talk. Yeah. I mean, it was, the White House was not a <laughs> seat of power. It was just the president's residence, really. So, um, you know, for instance, I just did a presentation on Saturday about Lincoln. We all heard of the Lincoln bedroom in the White House. It wasn't a bedroom. It's called the Lincoln bedroom now because that's what Lincoln's office was. He didn't meet in the Oval Office. He just met in this one room, and that's where he did everything. So the concept of the White House and the president being in the White House has changed drastically over its history. Um, it, it really just went from a residence. Now it's one of the most heavily guarded places in the world. So uh, just... Reflection of the change of times, but also reflection in the change in the perception of the president and the office of the president. So. Um, yes. Last comment with regard to uh, Gerald Ford, just reading his bio here. I mean, he was a tremendous football player, Yale uh, school, law school graduate, uh, all kinds of decorations, and mm -hmm. very, very accomplished. Yet he had the reputation, probably because of Saturday Night Live, of being a bumbler. Yep. But they said when he was in the White House, people could walk in because he forgot to lock the door. Uh, Again, they wouldn't, they wouldn't take his papers to the National Archives because they were written in crayon, stuff like that. <laughs> None of which was true. No, and and part of that is just how he becomes president too. Um, that was sort of the big joke is that he kind of just fell into it. Um, literally. In, yeah, <laughs> and in case of Chevy Chase's impression, yes, literally. I mean, I mean, he did fall one time and they ran with that. So, I mean, that's, that's also the power of television and, you know, being in the limelight all the time that all of your little missteps people are going to know about, which, you know, two generations before wasn't the case. Um, so, yes, unfortunately, he does get a bad rap in, in the sense of his personal, you know, abilities. Mm -hmm. um, so, he, he became an easy target, and even if it wasn't true, that's, it, satire is what it is. So. He was very distinguished, but they said he quit playing water polo because his horse is drowned. <laughs> <laughs> you got to admit they're good jokes, but, uh, That's <laughs> but uh, even with Gerald Ford, he actually was uh, recruit. Well, their NFL teams were trying to get him to play professionally, and he turned that down to to go to Yale be, to pursue a. And the NFL at that time was not what it is today, so it would not have guaranteed him any sort of fame and success. But the Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions wanted him, so. Any, any other questions? Or presidential stories, or, you know? What do you see for our future? Do you see what coming back? You see what coming back? Any that our future for us to stop in? Um, I'm going to say probably not. Um, you know, unless, uh, well, they all fly by plane now, so unless they're taking a, a small <laughs> <laughs> commuter aircraft, they're not really going to be stopping in Genesee County, but you never know. Um, I mean, early 2000s, Hillary Clinton stopped. So, you, I could see it for more of a special event or something, major recognition. Our West Wing project. Exactly. Once, once that gets up, we're going to get uh, Obama back to come <laughs> and, and speak or something. So, again, a lot of this is based around a campaign trail. 
the campaign trail does not function like that anymore. Um, so that kind of cuts us out of it. But you never know, um, especially when uh, you know with these you know post presidential careers. You know they get into a lot of different uh, goals and activities that maybe bring us right to our doorstep. Who knows? So. Um, but I'm not holding my breath, so. <laughs> it seems like now a lot of the former presidents, when they do after they're out of office, it's either a book tour or a speaking tour. It's all, it's a big, a big money, yeah. a big money thing now. They want to go to communities where whatever they're speaking to these are going to be 50,000, 100,000 yes. dollars. It's all about the, the dollars. And so unfortunately, we also don't have the political clout with individuals that we used to have. Barbara Pennell was the best example of that, but you know, I mean, that's the whole reason Bush comes. It's because of Connell. It's not because of anything else. So um, if we get one of those type of individuals that has a lot of clout can kind of represent our area, that might change. It, you know, that, that's always a possibility. But the districts has also drastically changed. We're part of a much larger district that covers a lot more area. So yeah, they, they'll come to their district, but does that mean they're coming to our neck of the woods? Not necessarily so. And once the train became much less the primary mode of transportation, that's when you see the Tavia become much less of a, a stop. So. Good job. Anything else? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, uh, quick PSA for upcoming things. Tomorrow night, we have our next guest speaker, uh, Reverend Jeremiah Williams of the Mount Zion Baptist Church here in Batavia. will be coming to talk about the history of the church and sort of uh, black history in general in our area, but the church being a central aspect of that. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, and I forgot to uh, thank Pub Pub Coffee for sponsoring the uh, coffee yes. today. Oh. And they will be doing it all year round. And for providing the cookies for us today. They're safe, don't worry. Um, so then going into March, we have a, a busy month again. Uh, we have uh, our ne the next next guest speaker is uh, by Michael McBride. This will be Tuesday, March 12th. And he'll be talking about his distant relative John Joseph Exile McBride, who was exiled from Ireland, joined the Fenian movement, but eventually became a leading voice for Irish rights, both in the United States and abroad. Uh, even met with six presidents uh, and stayed at the British Prime Minister's house for a time while he was having negotiations with him and was here in 1894 when this building was dedicated as a museum. And he's buried in Rockport. So uh, this is sort of a genealogy project that has just gone wild. So he will be talking all about everything he found out about his ancestor and everything he did, which is going to be a very interesting presentation. So that will be at 7 o'clock on Tuesday, March 12th. Uh, Thursday, March 14th is our next trivia in honor of Women's History Month. I'll be talking about some famous women of history in our trivia. Uh, then we have another guest speaker on March 21st, uh, Juliana White will be talking about her book called Our Invisible String. It's a, it's a historic novel, but it's set in Buffalo in 1957, and it's sort of about growing up during that time. Uh, so that, that should be very interesting. A little different take on our historical narratives. Uh, and that, so those are all at 7. Uh, and our next job with Joe. Uh, which will be March 28th, Tyler will be presenting on 19th century uh, weddings and bridal wear. So be sure to come by and check that out. And Saturday, March 23rd is our next big, big event. It's our next edition of our Murder Mystery Dinner Theater put on by Western New York Improv. We will be at the Batavia Country Club again. Anybody who went the, the last time, uh, this one might even be more fun, as it is called Spirits and Suspects, a Roaring Twenties Murder Mystery. So it's set during the 20s, 
and they worked in a solar eclipse. So it should be a lot of fun. Uh, tickets are $75. You can actually, we have them online as well. Uh, so if you want to purchase them that way, just go to our website. There's links everywhere for it. Uh, or give us a call and we can help you work it out. Uh, and there's choice of meals. It includes your meal. Uh, I got dessert this time. So we might all be stuck too stuffed for it, but I got it. So uh, there's also a cash bar and a really wonderful performance by Western Dark Improv. So that's everything coming up for the next month. I hope to see you. There's no army coming. Thank you. I totally forgot. Uh, how could I? They would kill me. But, uh, Friday, March 15th, so just in time for St. Patrick's Day, No Blarney is coming back. Uh, a two-hour show this year. Oh, so they're wow. giving us some extra time from 7 to 9. There will be an intermission, so don't worry. Go up, use the bathroom, you know, all that. You can do that. Uh, tickets for that are $5 uh, or $4 if you remember. And they always put on a good show. So, And uh, I think they might have been adding some new songs to the repertoire, too. So there might be some things we haven't heard before. So, yes, thank you for that reminder. Uh, too much going on. Eh? No slips to the track. Yes, sir. Uh, some time ago, you had Mike Eula speak about his upcoming book, The Current County Historian. And he was extremely interested. I don't know. His book is supposed to come out in April. Yes, yeah, so I did get him again. Good. I will have him talk about a different aspect of the book than what he did before. Yes, it was a long delayed process. It's supposed to, it's been, he, it was supposed to be out about two years ago, and it's finally out now. Uh, we are getting copies of it, so you can get them here once they come out. They're coming out the end of April. So we actually did get him for May. So for the May job with Joe. So we will have time to talk to him about that. It, it came out through uh, our, uh, Acadia Press, actually, which does a lot of the local history books. Uh, a lot of them that we had in the gift shop actually come through them. So I'm glad to see somebody finally latched on to it. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a manageable tome now versus a, a, a giant academic work. So um, yeah, so that will be the main job with Joe. And uh, Don Burke will be doing an April job with Joe for us. So. Yeah, who's in that grave? Yes. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> who's in that grave? Um, so yeah, that's that's what's coming up. So I hope to see you guys uh, at the upcoming events. And if you haven't already, check out all the changes we made to the front of the museum, the new exhibits. Uh, we have the expanded eclipse exhibit now, 98 years since the sun went out, that Tyler has taken the lead on and made. You you won't recognize the the front of the building now. So uh, and that. Uh, thank you. Bartentino. Yeah. Yes, wow. <laughs> yes, uh, local musician Bart Dantino is coming Friday, April 26th at 7. He does uh, acoustic uh, guitar shows and things, so it should be a nice, uh, nice evening here. Um, there, believe me, there's a lot more coming up, too. I won't run through the entire schedule. So uh, just check out the website. If you're on Facebook, everything's posted there. Uh, if you're getting our email blasts, uh, everything's there. If you're not getting our email blast and you want to, uh, you can let me know and I'll get it down. Uh, but the easiest way to do that is to become a member. Everybody might be a member here, but if you're not, that's the best way to uh, get informed of what's going on at the Holland Land Office Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.